The 1960s and 1970s were decades of military aviation filled with a plethora of experimentation centering on vertical and short takeoff and landing aircraft. Not until the British Harrier in the late 1960s was the dream officially realized in the military sphere. The United States, for its part during the period, undertook its own practical testing of such aircraft and attempted to apply it to a more tactically minded systems than just fighter or strike platforms. The LTV XC-142 was a product of such innovations, and these prototype aircraft represented a tri-service v slash toll capable transport for possible military service. Several attempts had been made, but the XC-142 was the most ambitious at the time and also the largest. An initiative born in the late 1950s spurred the major American military services to develop a joint service v slash toll platform to support existing helicopter-type operations and feature heavily in transporting goods and troops near the fighting lines. Range was of particular concern, but speed was also required to move elements from point A to point B in a short order. The United States Navy was chief lead of the program, which became known under the name of Tri-Service Assault Transport Program. In 1959, the United States Army, Navy, and Air Force began work on the development of a prototype v slash toll aircraft that could augment helicopters and transport-type missions. Specifically, they were interested in designs with longer range and higher speeds than existing helicopters. In order to support operations over long distances, or in the case of the United States Marine Corps, from further offshore. The XC-142 program was born. The largest aircraft of its type was to meet several requirements in addition to vertical takeoff and landing. And the objective was for it to potentially cover many civilian uses apart from its invaluable military applications. The group made it clear that all previous VTOL attempts had been developed to test a specific principle and to prove that it could be accomplished. Consequently, few of these concepts had operational capabilities, which required the XC-142 to be tested directly in operational environments. It was then decided that the new aircraft would meet the requirements for all three branches of service, giving birth to the first tri-service VTOL model. Compared to previous efforts, the XC-142 was an ambitious program with optimistic performance goals. On the 27th of January 1961, a series of DOD actions resulted in an agreement where all of the military services would work on the Tri-Service Assault Transport Program under the Navy's Bureau of Naval Weapons Leadership. The American conglomerate Vought eventually entered a proposal that combined their own engineering but that implemented the helicopter experience from aeronautical companies Ryan and Hiller. And, by September, Vought Hiller Ryan was announced as the winner. The project's main contractor was Vought Aeronautics Division of Ling Tecmo Vought. The subcontractors were Ryan, in charge of the ampanage, aft section, engine nacelles, and wing, and Hiller, responsible for the transmission system, selected components, and the flap and aileron. Soon after, a contract was signed for five prototypes, with a specified first flight date set for July of 1964. Initially, the design was named Vought Ryan Hiller XC-142, but it was then dropped after Vought joined the LTV Aerospace Corporation. In January of 1962, the original outline had been drawn up as a replacement for the Sikorsky HR-2S with a payload on the order of 10,000 pounds. Buweps released a revised specification that specified the same payload, but extended the operational radius to 250 miles and increased the cruising airspeed to 250 to 300 knots, and the maximum airspeed to 300 to 400 knots. However, for the Marine Corps mission, the requirements stated that the fuel load could be reduced so that the maximum gross weight could not exceed 35,000 pounds, as long as a 100 nautical mile radius was maintained. During the prototype development, the Navy decided to exit the program. They were concerned that the strong propeller downwash would make it difficult to operate. Their existing HR-2S fleet had a ground pressure of about 7.5 psi, and proved to blow people about on the ground and stir up considerable amounts of debris. The C-142 was predicted to have an even higher loading of 10 psi, which they believed would limit it to operations to and from prepared landing pads and was therefore unsuitable for assault operations. 
The XC-142 weighed around 22,595 pounds while empty and about 34,474 pounds when fully loaded. Its fuselage was 58 foot 1 inch long and its wingspan 67 foot 6 inches long and 26 foot 1 inch high. The fuselage was stout, intended to carry considerable cargo, and its inner compartment was enough for 32 equipped troops or 8,000 pounds of cargo. A single tall vertical tail provided a 129 square foot area, whereas the wing area encompassed 534 square feet. Meanwhile, the high mounted wings were fitted with trailing double slotted flaps along each wing. Fuel capability amounted to 370 liters, with a planned capacity for auxiliary tanks for added range. Power consisted of four 3080 horsepower General Electric T64-GE-1 engines mounted in nacelles on the wings, which were all cross-linked together. Each drove a giant four-bladed 15.5 feet diameter Hamilton standard fiberglass propeller, the tips of each practically overlapping each other. Later in the program, Hamilton Standard would provide an improved version of the propeller using the 2FF blade design, which featured a wider planform, rounded tips, and a more pronounced twist than earlier 2EF blades. The goal of the new design was to improve aerodynamic load distribution and overcoming a static load problem. A fifth, three-bladed fiberglass propeller was driven by four main engines. It was mounted in the tail, rotating horizontally and interconnected through a gear and shaft train. If the engines failed, there was still enough power for the five propellers. However, the setup was highly complex. The rotation was brought together at the top of the fuselage through cross-shafting gearboxes from each engine. The power was then sent back to the tail rotor through a tail propeller shaft, into the tail propeller gearbox, and onto the variable pitch tail propeller. The propulsion system of the XC-142 was definitely an overpowered situation. If the XC-142 lost an engine during takeoff, it could still clear 50-foot obstacles in 400 feet while carrying almost 10,000 pounds. If all engines were operating, the rate of climb at sea level was 6,800 feet per minute. For control during ascent, there was a differential propeller pitch that regulated roll, a tail rotor that managed pitch, and a propeller slipstream deflection provided by ailerons that manipulated yaw. The craft had a unique capability with the main lift system in that the wing was capable of rotating through 98 degrees instead of the expected straight vertical position. The wing tilt mechanism consisted of two screw jack actuators driven by a centrally located hydraulic motor. The tilt was controlled by a variable rate switch on each collective lever, or by a constant rate switch. This allowed the plane to hover in a stationary mode in a tailwind condition. The center and outboard sections of the double slotted tailing edge flaps doubled as ailerons, Although the flaps were programmed to automatically shift with wing tilt, the pilot could override the process. On the other hand, the slats on the leading edge suppressed the stall. Mounted on the outboard of each nacelle, the slats also operated automatically as a function of flap position. Meanwhile, the slab-type horizontal tail assembly was supported by a vertical tail and operated as a standard rudder and fin configuration. The magic in the design was probably in the intricate control system a fully powered irreversible type with artificial fuel forces and powered dual independent hydraulic systems. Dual cockpit controls consisted of conventional rudder pedals, control sticks, and collective levers for all takeoffs and landings, provided the highest technology of the system. The XC-142 design also considered logistics implications. In addition to the VTOL design goals, with the tail rotor rigged to fold to the port side to reduce storage length and protect against damage during a loading operation. The design was completed within 33 months, and the first model was finally fabricated, ground tested, and flown. The first XC-142 was rolled out in early 1964, with its conventional flight being made in September 1964. Its first hover three months later, and first transition two months later than that. The remaining prototypes soon followed. Suitability testing began at and around Edwards Air Force Base in the fall of 1965. Many test hours were logged in various locations in California and in the Pacific. The XC-142 was tested above ground in natural conditions, with a firm subsurface and three inches of loose land. No cleaning up was done and no debris was removed. Keeping the wing angle at 25 degrees or less could minimize ingestion for short takeoff and landings. Although dust clouds obscured the aircraft while lifting during vertical takeoffs, the pilot could always see the ground. 
The Air Force extensively tested the XC-142's capability with cargo flights, cargo, and paratrooper drops, along with desert, mountain, rescue, and carrier operations. In 1966, one of the XC-142's passed operational tests to prove the model and carrier operations. In quick succession, the plane accomplished 44 short takeoffs and landings, along with six vertical takeoffs and landings from the USS Bennington. The carrier trials were accomplished using the number 5 prototype, which was crewed by both USMC, Navy, and Army pilots. The flight regime covered VTOL operations at a variety of speeds, which occurred at wind conditions from 5 to 30 knots. A large variety of wings and flap tilt angles were used during the testing. Also, there were landings accomplished with 3 and 6 degree glide slopes. In an amazing demonstration, the plane negotiated a 360 degree turn within the width of the flight deck. That same year, one of the prototypes was also tested in an overwater pickup operation. The plane lifted a man from a life raft to determine its capability for rescue and recovery. A standard Navy horse collar sling was attached to 124 feet of cable and then lowered through a floor hatch just aft of the cockpit. The tests proved that there were no problems with effects on the propeller downwash or slipstream turbulence. The program called for the building of five prototypes, but cross-shaft problems, along with some operator errors, resulted in a number of hard landings causing damage to the complete fleet. Furthermore, vibration and noise in the cockpit proved increasingly annoying and a real challenge for the 39 pilots who flew 420 hours in total. Unfortunately, several accidents significantly damaged the fleet. On October 19, 1965, the second aircraft experienced a ground loop causing extensive damage to the wing and propeller, and in 1966, prototypes 3 through 5 were also damaged by a hard landing in vertical mode, turbine failure, and pilot error. The most serious of the mishaps, resulting from a tail rotor drive shaft failure, caused three fatalities. Then, in May of 1967, an accident took place near the Dallas LTV plant and occurred in a heavily wooded area where a fire started after the impact. The flight plan for the ill-fated prototype included a rapid decrease in altitude from 8,000 feet to 3,000 feet, effectively simulating a pilot rescue under combat conditions. A nose-over at low altitude followed, from which the crew could not recover. The crashed aircraft was XC-142 No. 1, which had flown 148 times at the time of the crash. The final decision on the disposition of the aircraft occurred during the Category 2 Operational Suitability Program, which was conducted at the Air Force Flight Test Center. The testing consisted of 113 flights, totaling 163.9 hours, which was accomplished between July 1965 and August 1967. Another XC-142 complaint was the excessive vibration and noise in the cockpit, when coupled with an excessively high pilot workload, which presented a considerable challenge in the cockpit. The program was considered effort, with 39 different pilots flying the prototypes for a total of 420 hours. The greatest national exposure the XC-142 received during its flight test program occurred when the number 4 prototype participated in the 1967 Paris Air Show. In fact, because the US Navy and the US Air Force were no longer interested in the capabilities of the aircraft, the program was stopped in 1967, and the only remaining XC-142 is given to NASA for additional tests until 1970, the year when the program was permanently abandoned. The only remaining XC-142, number 2, currently is on display at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson's Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. Despite its overall success, the XC-142 did not gather enough interest from the market to keep the project alive, and it was concluded that the program did not contribute enough in terms of technology. However, it is said that if the mechanical problems were solved, the XC-142 would have soon achieved operational status. tighter we can maintain the tolerance without getting rubs, so obviously the more power we will get out of the engine. We're beyond the point where solid airfoils can do the job from an engine standpoint. We need hollow airfoils. We're talking about high temperature super alloys. So you electrochemically machine them. 
there's a whistle blows when you get the players out in the field, and that's where product support starts. And we have to play the game. That's after you've delivered the product. Because there are so many things that uh, have to be checked out before this engine goes out. This gives us a perfect engine. But this is the culmination of all their efforts. The actual proof of the pudding is, does the engine run and perform as it should do? the balance of power is a notable feat. To maintain the margin of strength is an even more formidable challenge in our time of revolutionary technology. The strength of the free world is dependent on its military air superiority, and air superiority depends on the power of the jet. The people at General Electric are committed to making jet engines better. Since 1942, they've produced almost 60,000 aircraft turbine engines. Craftsmen and engineers, many with more than 25 years' experience, continue to build in new standards of performance and reliability and reflect the skills and resources of the company that produced America's first jet engine. More than 20,000 General Electric military turbine engines are now in service. Throughout the world, they power 32 types of aircraft, accumulating over 15,000 flight hours every day. The T-58, which pioneered U.S. turbine-powered helicopter flight, is the smallest General Electric military engine in production. But each man has a responsibility to see that that engine going up the line has got to be a quality product. They had two pilots in here, and they was praising our engines up and down the line because they said that they, they're in and out to pick up and get in and get out quick, and that's what they need. They got plenty of power, and they love them. The T-58 can produce up to 1,870 horsepower and is the world's most widely applied helicopter engine. With over 10 years of field experience, this engine has been proven in every type of mission. The T-58 has seen extensive service in Southeast Asia, powering a variety of helicopters for combat assault, rescue and recovery, and for vertical supply. T-64 turboshaft and turboprop engines deliver more than twice the power of the T-58. I've been here at the G about 24 years now. I've been working on jets most of my life. My son just come back from Vietnam. He was working on the engines out there. Designed for low fuel consumption and high reliability, the T-64 powers both rotary wing and fixed wing aircraft heavy assault helicopters, air rescue helicopters, an advanced aerial fire support system, short takeoff and landing medium transports, patrol aircraft for the Japanese Navy, and a tilt-wing vertical takeoff and landing transport. T-64s will power a new Italian medium transport now under development and a new German vertical takeoff and landing transport. The J-85, General Electric's smallest turbojet. It delivers more power per pound of weight than any other engine in production. What we try to keep in mind is that these things are going up in the air and uh, there isn't room for mistakes. The J-85 has logged more than 5 million flight hours in 15 types of military aircraft. Afterburning versions can produce up to 5,000 pounds of thrust. Non-afterburning versions power a number of high-performance subsonic aircraft. Twin J-85s provide immediate strike power for attack aircraft. Because of its compactness and high thrust-to-weight ratio, it is used for boost power on medium assault transports and powers experimental vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. The J-79 is General Electric's largest military turbojet in production. This is your baby and you're responsible from the time you start until you finish. I'm as concerned about one as I would be the other. 
as far as reliability would be concerned. Capable of producing 17,900 pounds of thrust, the J-79 has become the free world's Mach 2 workhorse. It is the power plant for the Starfighter, a multi-mission supersonic fighter. The Hustler, a supersonic bomber. The Vigilante, an attack bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. And the Phantom II, a Mach 2 fighter interceptor. The TF-39, the most powerful military engine in the world. This high bypass turbofan can produce more than 41,000 pounds of thrust. You feel like you've accomplished something, especially when you send it to test, because you're one of the last men to look at it before they wind it up. It gives you a feeling that you've accomplished something, when you, especially when you see it go out the door. Four TF-39 engines lift the giant C-5, the world's largest transport, with its 132-ton payload, delivering it to any spot in the world in less than 24 hours. General Electric military engines are in service in 31 countries, making service and support a vital global responsibility. Over 300 people stationed throughout the world keep constant watch over all General Electric military engines. They instruct operations personnel in troubleshooting and maintenance techniques. They provide immediate assistance in solving field problems. And most of all, they represent GE on the spot, reporting field troubles, permitting factory action to head off problems before they become major difficulties. Take a group of personnel, base personnel, we can train them, show them this is how you do it, the next time you'll know by yourself. So it's always a need for someone, product support, to keep the personnel at the base efficient in their jobs, really. Back home, computers help keep track of spare part inventories and usage rates, and then predict field needs to keep General Electric engines flying. Since America's first jet engine in 1942, giant strides have been made in performance and efficiency. Well, I came into the supercharger business in 1940, and it wasn't very long after that uh, we took on the IA job. Compare this engine, it's a 25 to 30 year time span in aircraft engine technology. The TF-39 puts out 30 times the thrust and only uses a fifth as much fuel per pound of thrust. In the C-5, ranges of five to even 10,000 miles are perfectly possible. And without any question, the next 30 years will give us the same amount of progress. New technology continually replaces the old. General Electric's 100 research laboratories contribute developments in chemistry, metallurgy, every phase of research. Advanced manufacturing processes are tailored to the characteristics of newly developed materials. And year after year, new engine specifications demand closer tolerances, specialized manufacturing methods, and more precise machining of engine components. In looking to the future for new engine concepts, new engine systems, we strive always for simplicity. We found looking down through the years that if we achieve simplicity, we get the things we want. Low cost, light weight, high thrust weight ratio, good ruggedness, reliability, durability, more easily maintained parts. When we try to apply new materials such as composites, for instance, uh, new concepts and engine components, we try to put these together to realize fewer parts, greater simplicity. Simplicity is the name of the game. Innovative technology makes possible lightweight compressors that achieve greater engine efficiency by producing higher pressures in fewer stages. They're more rugged and less susceptible to foreign object damage. Lightweight, high-intensity combustors burn more efficiently and produce less smoke. The higher the operating temperatures, the more efficient the engine. Sophisticated air cooling techniques permit advanced turbines to operate in gases whose temperatures far exceed the thermal limits of the turbine materials. As engines become more sophisticated, so do the methods for testing them. Extensive environmental testing assures the reliable performance of individual components and the complete engine. The high altitude facility at Evendale, Ohio can test engine performance at simulated speeds up to Mach 3 and altitudes over 80,000 feet. J-79 
General Electric's crosswind facility at Peebles, Ohio, creates environmental wind conditions up to hurricane velocity. Thorough testing prepares the engine for flight, the ultimate test. Engines for a new generation of aircraft are now under development. Advanced turboshaft and turboprop engines with ratings up to 25,000 shaft horsepower for assault and heavy lift helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. Augmented turbojets for tactical fighters. High bypass turbofans for anti-submarine warfare aircraft and transports. Augmented turbofans are demonstrating technologies for new engines to power air superiority fighters and strategic aircraft. Uh, it's a certain amount of invention involved in this, but the invention is really a way to use what you know in a way you've never used it before. A way to take what you've learned in little bits and pieces and adapt this technology specifically to a given military requirement. The research continues. The search for innovation in design, for improvements in materials, for new technologies. The people of General Electric are dedicated to making today's engines better. And they will continue to provide power for the aircraft of tomorrow. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.